There have been a considerable number of unsolved murders where a person or family were brutally slaughtered with an axe inside their homes. These murders all took place between 1879 and 1922, a span of 43 years, the length of an average man's working life. Yet all of them have remarkable and chilling similarities to each other. The first one in 1879 and the last one in 1922 have the most similarities, despite the span of years and vast distance between them. There appears to be a chance that all of these horrific slayings were committed by the same person who could have been spree killing on and off from his twenties into his sixties. 1879 Martin and Susan DeFore were an elderly couple living alone in a home on Iceville Road on the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia in the USA. They were well liked in the community and it was said of them that they had not a known enemy in the world. On the rainy night of Friday, July the 25th, 1879, they were both brutally murdered in their beds with an axe. The attack was so savage and violent that they were both nearly decapitated. The axe used in the attack was later found in the fireplace, covered in ashes and blood. A chilling fact that emerged during the investigation is that it appeared the killer or killers were hiding inside an upstairs room for a day or two before the murders. They found human excrement and muddy footprints, indicating entry through a window. The killer or killers waited until Friday night before creeping downstairs to slaughter Mr. and Mrs. DeFore. Barefoot footprints were also found from the house to the woodshed where the killer or killers retrieved the axe on that rainy night. Robbery was not the motive as many valuable things remained untouched, including the owner's stash of silver which was in plain sight. It also appeared that the murderer or murderers were in no hurry and helped themselves to some food and milk in the kitchen, either before or after the slayings. Despite extensive publicity and a long investigation and manhunt, the perpetrator or perpetrators were never found, and the case remains unsolved to this day, over 135 years later. 1884 Only five years after the murders of the DeFore couple in Georgia, 25-year-old Molly Smith was sleeping in her home at 901 West Pecan Street in Austin, Texas, when an unknown intruder attacked her in bed with an axe, dragged her still conscious body into the backyard, and raped and murdered her. The murder shocked the city, and a fevered investigation was launched, but the perpetrator was never caught. Several months passed. On the night of Thursday, the 7th of May, 1885, Neighbors heard shrill screams of terror from 302 East Cypress Street, which was the home of 30-year-old Eliza Shelley. When neighbors arrived, they nearly fainted at the sight they saw. Miss Shelley had been murdered with an axe so viciously that her head had been split open and her brain was exposed, and her entire bed was bright red, having been soaked with blood they found a single footprint from a barefoot person in blood, but her killer was never caught. The city of Austin, after these two terrible murders of random people in their city, was justifiably very frightened. Their horror only increased over the next several months, as four more people were found slaughtered in their beds in a similar manner. Panic reached a fever pitch when, on the night of Christmas Eve, 1885, two more people were found butchered in their homes. Then the killing stopped, as suddenly and randomly as they had begun. The eight crime scenes all had certain things in common. No apparent motive, nothing stolen, 
and a bloody axe or similar sharp implement was left behind. Each was murdered in their beds, or occasionally dragged into the backyard first. Sometimes footprints were found, but police bloodhounds were, for some reason, never able to pick up the trail of the murderer. Another chilling detail is that in every case, no nearby dog ever barked or raised an alarm, even those that were fenced in close to the house. All eight murders remain unsolved. 1897. Twelve years passed by, and our story moves to the rural community of Paradise Ridge, Tennessee. At about 10 p.m. on the night of Tuesday, the 23rd of March, 1897, a local man went to get a glass of water before bed, when he noticed a strange glow about a half mile in the distance. He realized it was in about the same location as the farm of his neighbors, the Aid family, so he quickly rode out to see what had happened. What he found was shocking. The Aid family farmhouse and every other building on the property was on fire, with some buildings already having fallen down from the flames. Then it began to rain. He went to the farmhouse and saw a truly grisly sight. The entire Aid family had been brutally murdered with an axe. Mr. Jacob Aid, age 60, his wife Pauline, aged 50, their daughter Lizzie, aged 20, and son Henry, aged 13. Reconstructing the events, it seems that the entire family was sitting in the parlor at about 8 p.m. when the intruder suddenly appeared and killed Mr. Aid with a blow of the axe while he was still sitting in his chair. The rest of the family panicked and tried to escape, but he finished them off one by one. The body of a ten-year-old neighbor girl, Rosa Morier, was also found in the rubble, but her body was not as badly burned as the others. It was speculated that she had initially been able to escape while the family was being murdered, but the killer ran after her, catching and killing her, then threw her body back into the burning house. She was found with one arm raised above her head, with a hand cut off, and her skull split open. Robbery was not a motive, since there was a large amount of cash and other valuables within easy reach that were not taken. Chillingly, as in the DeFore murders, there was evidence that the killer had fixed himself a meal before setting the house ablaze and leaving. Despite a massive investigation, the perpetrator was never found. A gravestone now sits in the lonely field where the aid home once stood. 1911 Fourteen years passed quietly by without any reports of the kind of horrors on this list. If these were all the work of a single killer, it is possible that he either went dormant, as we know sometimes happens with serial killers, or else he was killing people one at a time, or possibly did commit similar crimes which, being over a century ago, we simply have no current record of, or which were blamed on the wrong suspects. What we do know is that on June the 8th, 1911, a family of four was found murdered in their house in Ardenwald, Oregon, near Portland, by means of an axe. The bodies of the children were found in their beds, but the bodies of the parents were found in another part of the house. There was no obvious motive, and the killer was never found. 1911 Only a month after the slayings in Oregon, concerned neighbors entered the home of Mr. and Mrs. Archie Coble, near Rainier, Washington. They had both been murdered in bed with an axe. Nothing of value had been taken from the house. Many noted the similarity to the horror only a few weeks earlier in the neighboring state, but there were few clues to go on. Before two more months had gone by, however, the body count would accelerate dramatically as the killer moved back east. 1911 On the night of Sunday, the 17th of September, 1911, in Colorado Springs, 
a person wielding an axe entered the home of Mrs. Alice May Burnham and murdered her in her bed, along with her six-year-old daughter and three-year-old son. Mrs. Burnham's sister found the bodies three days later when she went to the home after becoming concerned about not hearing from them. After seeing the mangled bodies, she ran out of the house and screamed for the neighbors. Many people quickly arrived, with the noticeable exception of the Wayne family next door. Some people went over to see why they hadn't come out, only to discover the grisly sight. Mr. Henry Wayne, his wife Blanche, and their one-year-old baby had also all been slaughtered in their beds with an axe, so horrifically that their skulls were crushed. The axe itself was found nearby. It was discovered that the killer had entered through a window. After butchering each person, he carefully made up the beds, tucking each bloody corpse into the sheets as if putting them to bed. As in previous cases, there was nothing missing, and robbery was therefore not a motive. Both houses were also found locked from the inside. 1911 Only 13 days after the massacre of the two families in Colorado Springs, members of the First Presbyterian Church in Monmouth, Illinois, arrived for the Sunday morning service, only to discover the church doors still locked. They phoned the caretaker, Mr. William Dawson, whose responsibility it was to unlock the church that morning, but he didn't answer his phone. A few of the men went to his house to fetch him. When they arrived at Mr. Dawson's home, they found the window blinds all closed. On going inside, they found the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Dawson and their teenage daughter dead in their beds with their skulls crushed. Robbery was not a possible motive because, as in all the previous murders, nothing had been stolen from the house. 1911 Two weeks after the Dawson family slayings, a woman in Ellsworth, Kansas was worried about her neighbors, who were no longer answering their telephone. She walked over to check on them and found their door ajar. She went inside and found that the entire family of five had been murdered in their beds. Mr. and Mrs. Sherman and their three children, all of them killed with an axe. The axe had been stolen from another neighbor's yard and was left inside the house. Strangely, their telephone was covered with a piece of clothing, perhaps to muffle the sound of the ringer. 1911 the pattern of a family murdered approximately every two weeks continued. Since two weeks after the Sherman family killings, the killer struck again in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, but this time unsuccessfully. On the morning of Tuesday, the 30th of October, 1911, Mr. J.B. Jordan left his home for work. He left by the kitchen and neglected to lock the door on his way out. Twenty minutes later, his eldest son heard his mother yell from downstairs and rushed down to find her laying in bed covered in blood with a serious head wound. She soon went into unconsciousness and on waking up had no memory of the attack, though she had been attacked so brutally that she was now blind in one eye. Nothing of value was taken from the home. 1912 Eight months later, the killer returned to Kansas this time to the town of Paola. Neighbors were concerned that a young couple who lived nearby, 21-year-old Mr. Roland Hudson and his wife, had not been seen lately. They went to their house and discovered that they had both been murdered in their beds. Nothing of value was taken. One of the window screens had been cut and set aside so that the killer could obtain entry to the house. Very creepily, the same night as the Hudson murders, another family in the same town awoke to the sound of a lamp crashing to the floor somewhere inside their house. A man was then seen leaving. They later discovered that he had entered through a window. The local sheriff believed that this had been the same home invader responsible for the previous murders. 
one can only say that this family was very fortunate. 1912. Less than a week after the previous murders, the killer returned to Iowa, to the town of Villisca. On the morning of Monday, June the 11th, 1912, Mrs. Mary Peckham went to check on her neighbors, who were not out doing their morning chores as usual. She knocked on their door, but received no answer. Most people kept their homes unlocked in this day and age, especially in farming communities, so she tried the door handle, but it was locked. She called over another neighbor who had a spare key, and after going inside, they discovered the horrible crime scene. The entire Moore family had been annihilated. Mr. Josiah Moore, aged 43, his wife Sarah, 39, their daughter Catherine, aged 10, and their three sons, Herman, aged 11, Arthur, 7, and Paul, 5. In addition, two girls, sisters, who were having a sleepover with the Moore daughter, were also butchered. Lena and Ina Mae Stillinger, aged 8 and 12, respectively. Mr. Moore had received so many horrific blows to his face that his corpse was unrecognizable, and his eyes were missing. The killer had swung the axe so fiercely that there were gouge marks on the ceiling from the upswing. The bloody axe was found in the room downstairs where the girls had been sleeping. One of the girls had apparently woken up during the attack, since she had a deep wound on her arm as though she had held it up in defense. Every mirror in the house had been draped and covered with pieces of clothing. In addition to the axe murders themselves, three additional details are eerily similar to the slaughter of the DeFore couple in Atlanta 33 years earlier. Firstly, nothing was stolen. Secondly, it appeared that the killer spent time just roaming around the house afterwards, even preparing himself a plate of food in the kitchen. Thirdly, and most eerily, evidence suggested that the killer had hidden in the attic for some unknown period of time before the murders, smoking cigarettes and waiting for the family to go to sleep before coming out to slaughter them. Despite a ten-year-long intensive investigation, which included the participation of the nation's leading criminologists, the murderer was never found. Update in 2015, a ghost researcher who was staying in the house overnight suddenly stabbed himself in the chest at 1 a.m., surviving but with serious injuries. He said he did not know why he did it, but just felt the urge. 1914 Two years after the massacre in Villisca, a family in Blue Island, Illinois, was found murdered in their beds. Mr. Jacob Misklick, along with his wife, adult daughter, and grandbaby. Nothing was taken, and no one was caught. 1918-1919 Seven people were murdered with an axe in and around New Orleans, Louisiana, between May of 1918 and October of 1919. Most victims were killed in bed after the perpetrator broke into their homes at night. As with the previous murders, nothing of value was taken, even when valuables were in plain sight, and the axe blows were almost exclusively made to the faces and necks of the victims. The bloody axe in each case was typically found nearby. There was no known motive to these slayings. One new factor that appeared in these killings is that the murderers sent a chilling letter to the police, taunting them. It read, in part, Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. Let them, the police, 
not try to discover what I am. For it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have done in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you all think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. I have been, am, and will be, the worst spirit that ever existed either in fact or realm of fancy. The Axeman. In the letter he also wrote that he would spare any family that was heard playing jazz music at a high volume. 1922. New Orleans, the last known city where this serial killer operated, was and is a major port city with vast amounts of international shipping traffic every day. It is not inconceivable then that after the infamous murder spree in that city, with its unprecedented amounts of publicity, that the killer might seek escape to a new country. In the years leading up to the murder of the DeFore couple in Atlanta, more than seven million German immigrants arrived in the U.S., doubling the population, many of them through ports on the southeastern coast, including Savannah, only a few short hours train ride from Atlanta. Could a German immigrant have come to the U.S. as a young man, committed these terrible slayings on and off over the course of his adult life, only to return to his homeland when approaching retirement age. Who can say for sure? In any case, only four years after the slaughters in Louisiana, another ghastly crime happened in Germany, which in practically every detail matches those of the previous horrors. A German farmer, Mr. Andreas Gruber, who lived near Hinterkaifeck in Bavaria, told one of his neighbors that he had seen footprints in the snow leading from the edge of the forest to his house, but none leading back. He also said that he thought he had heard footsteps in the attic and a set of house keys had gone missing. He performed an extensive search of his house and outbuildings, but was unable to find any trace of an intruder. Several days later, on Tuesday the 4th of April 1922, Neighbors became concerned because no member of the Gruber family had been seen in several days. On entering the house, they discovered the bodies of the Gruber's two-year-old son and their maid, each slaughtered in their beds by a mattock, which is a type of axe. The bodies of the rest of the family, namely those of Mr. and Mrs. Gruber, their 35-year-old daughter Victoria, and their seven-year-old granddaughter, were found in the nearby barn, where they had apparently been lured one by one and then slaughtered. Tragically, the autopsy revealed that the seven-year-old girl likely survived her wounds for several hours while lying in the stroll next to the mangled bodies of her family. Large chunks of hair were also missing from her scalp, which she had apparently pulled out of her own head. As with the murders in the U.S., each of the bodies had been covered with sheets or straw. Robbery was also not a motive, because many valuables, including a large sum of money, were in plain sight or readily accessible. Chillingly, it also turned out that the killer did not leave immediately, but stayed in the farmhouse through the weekend. Meals were eaten, and those passing by remember seeing smoke rising from the chimney over a day after the family was killed. Investigators noted that it seemed the killer was unusually well skilled with the use of an axe, since all of the blows were very precise and confidently delivered. Over 100 suspects were interviewed, but no one was ever arrested due to lack of evidence. The heads of the victims were sent to Munich for evaluation but at some point they were lost, and so the headless bodies of the victims now rest in their graves. 
It later came to light that six months before the atrocity, the Gruber family maid had quit, claiming that the house was haunted. The farmhouse was demolished a year later, and a memorial now stands at the site. Postscript If all of these crimes were the work of the same serial killer, then he murdered, at minimum, 61 people. Someone as cold-blooded and maniacal as him no doubt killed many more who were never accounted for, or for which records have been lost. If there is any lesson to be learned, it is to be aware of the very real threat of home invaders, who have continued to butcher families all over the world almost continuously since the Gruber family massacre of 1922. Keep your doors and windows locked, get a good alarm system, and report suspicious persons in your neighborhood to the police. Study personal self-defense, and obtain and learn the proper and safe use of a weapon. And, for God's sake, keep your bedroom door locked when you sleep. Update. Recently, an old and broken down military frigate was taken into dry dock in order to be scrapped. One of the workers on the operation went through the empty ship to catalogue its condition in detail before the demolition began. There was no longer any electricity aboard, and all he had with him was a dim flashlight and a camera as he walked alone through the deep, dark passages of the abandoned vessel. Since his camera had a flash, he would turn off his flashlight before taking photos, and he took hundreds of photos in this manner. Not long after sending all of his photo files to his supervisor, the worker received a worried and frantic call from his supervisor, asking who the man with the axe was. The worker had no idea what he was talking about, since he had been inside the ship alone. The supervisor then emailed him the photo in question. The worker was shocked when he saw it. Despite security CCTV monitoring the only entrance and exit point on the ship during the week since its arrival, no one besides the worker had been seen going aboard or leaving. A thorough search of the ship was performed, but no one was found. Has the Axeman returned?